entrusted with resources, gifts, and the gospel. They're the means we have to achieve our mission of developing devoted followers of Jesus. We've all been entrusted. Hi, I'm Adam. It's good to see you. We've all been entrusted. I love that last line in our sermon bumper. We've all been, I want you to let that sink in for just a moment. As a follower of Jesus, you have been entrusted. This sermon series we've, we've had through November is, is called Entrusted. It's really about the doctrine, the teaching of stewardship, the truth that God owns everything. Everything, every person belongs to the Lord. And, and it's probably not the typical way we go about thinking about life, at least not for most of us. So for this to be embraced, every one of us needs a change in perspective, maybe a, a paradigm shift. It's really the word repentance, a change of our mind, right? And we all need the change in the way we approach and view everything. Everything we have comes from the Lord. Everything? Like, really? Everything. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. Every talent, every dollar, every relationship, every clean bill of health, every understanding, a gift from God for us to take care of. He's entrusted at that to you. The word entrusted, it's a heavy word. Think about it. God has placed a trust in you. <laughs> Almighty God is trusting that you will receive what he gives you and that you will use it his way for his glory and the advancement of his kingdom. I want you to think about that. If you're married and, and your, your spouse is nearby, look at them. God has entrusted that person to you. You have a responsibility to God when it comes to how you relate to this person. To have and to hold. For better or for worse. For richer or for poorer in sickness and in health. To love and to cherish until death do you part. That's the promise you made to the Lord about his son or his daughter. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Wives, respect your husbands. God has entrusted them to you. What about the kids? God's entrusted them to you. Think about this. He could have given your children to anybody else on planet Earth, and he decided to entrust them to you. And he expects you to bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. To love them and to lead them and to teach them. It's your responsibility to correct them and encourage them and care for them and challenge them and then send them out. They belong to God, but he's entrusted them to your care. God entrusted your home to you. It's his. He's loaning it to you. It's meant to be a shelter for you and to shelter others, a place of love and care and instruction for your family and for other people. So like the Bible says, practice hospitality with the Lord's home. Do you, do you see how this idea of stewardship is such a big deal? It affects everything because everything belongs to the Lord. Your abilities, they're not yours. God entrusted those abilities and talents to you. And on purpose, they're different from, from everybody else. So that as many parts forming one body, when we're united and contributing to lifting up the name of Jesus, he might draw all men to himself. God uses all of those things that he's entrusted to us for his glory and for his kingdom. He entrusted those abilities to you. And then we can use those to earn an income. God has big expectations for our incomes, and they're very specific because money and the things money can buy are, are his biggest rivals in our lives. And so he entrusts money to us to, to manage wisely, to provide for our families, to advance his kingdom, and to bless other people. Stewardship, we tend to think, is just, oh, we're going to preach about money. It includes money, but it's so much bigger than that. It's really a perspective to live by. God has entrusted everything we have, 
on loan from him to us to manage and take care of. And that's why we have to think stewardship. It doesn't come naturally to us. We have to be intentional about knowing and accepting that we've been entrusted and, and, and by being intentional that we might be found faithful in the end. Today's message is the last one in the series. One more thing the Lord has entrusted to you and I to be faithful with. And I have to tell you, our, our sermon passage is, is rich. It's full. It's a great one. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, the first 13 verses. And you will be blessed this week, if you take, or if you just take a couple days and dig into this text. In fact, consider that a homework assignment. Spend some time slowly studying through 1 Thessalonians 2. I say that because... I'm not doing that today. That was my intention, but things change. Now, for those of you who are in life group, I know it's part of your homework for this week, so you'll get to dig into that together. Uh, just, by the way, quick commercial, life groups are going really well since we kicked them off in uh, September. We have 20 groups meeting in different places and different homes around the area throughout the week. And if you know life group, being a part of a small group is your next step, our our next group link is January 30th, back in the Cove. It's a Sunday in between services, uh, so put that on your calendar. I'm not going to walk through this text like I was going to because there's a phrase in this text that has captivated my mind for the last two weeks. I just can't get past it. And so that's what I'm preaching on. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is, is reminding the people of the town of Thessalonica about the time he visited them. You can read about that in Acts chapter 17. And it seems as though he's refuting some things. Maybe some accusations have been brought against him and his companions. And so Paul reminds them of, of the message he shared with them while he was there. He reminds them of the work he did, they did while they were there to not be a burden to the people. And he reminds them of how much that they love the people there in Thessalonica. I, I guess it's a great paragraph. But in this text, in verse 4, Paul uses this phrase, entrusted with the gospel. Entrusted with the gospel. In, in verse 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, or, nor are we trying to trick you. Paul says, hey, the things, the things that we, we share with you, they were the truth. We didn't make it up. We're, we're not trying to candy coat things or even make it sound better. It is what it is. This is. We're not trying to put one over on you. And he says in verse 4, this is where I've been stuck, on the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. And we're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. We speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Now, now I, I read this knowing I was going to be preaching today, and thinking, so thinking through it from that mindset, kind of sermon preparation, and so when I read this text, I immediately asked two questions. What is this gospel that, that they've been entrusted with, and who is the gospel entrusted to? Who's we? Paul makes this statement that they're approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So what is the gospel he's talking about? Now, now this word gospel can be found over 90 times in the New Testament, so it's, it's important. <laughs> and so we better figure this out. What is the gospel? The gospel is God's good news. That, that's what the word actually means, God's good news. But what's that? What is God's good news? I'm not trying to be trite or silly. It's really important that we, that we get this because God's good news has been distorted into all kinds of different things over the years. Let's quickly talk about what the gospel isn't. The gospel isn't this idea that God wants all of us healthy and wealthy and blessed. The gospel also isn't the other extreme that he wants us to be completely poor, give away everything we have, and take care of people. The gospel isn't our response to Jesus and his word. The gospel isn't an example to follow or, or instructions or good advice or how to feel about things. The gospel is not about finding peace or power or success or fulfillment. You see, the problem with all these approaches are that all these approaches to the gospel are about us. What we get or what we do. The gospel, God's good news, 
isn't about us. It's not about me. It's not about you. So what is it? What's the gospel that Paul's talking about? That's one of my favorite things about the Bible. We don't just have to like figure it all out. The Holy Spirit guided Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 into defining it for us. He says in verse 1, Now, brothers and sisters, I, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you're saved, if, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Paul received it straight from Jesus, and he passes it on to people as the most important thing. Here it is. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. The gospel. Simple. God's good news. You see, it's all about Jesus. What Jesus has done. Jesus left heaven, he came to earth, he died in our place, and he was buried in a tomb, and he rose from the dead on the third day. The gospel is a message that centers on the person of Jesus, not you. And it's news, which means it's information that needs to be passed on to others. The gospel is the news of what Jesus has done. The gospel isn't about you and me, but it is for us. You see, peace and power and new life, God's blessing and purpose and all those things, they're all results of the gospel. Those are, are all made possible because of what Jesus has done. But the moment we try to proclaim the results as the message, we're getting it wrong. We're making it about us and not about Jesus. We aren't sharing the gospel anymore. The gospel is about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so then when we read other verses about the gospel, that's what we're talking about. In Acts chapter 16, in verse 10, Luke wrote the book of Acts, and so he's writing, he's with Paul, and Paul gets this vision from God about where they're supposed to go next. In chapter 16, verse 10, it says, after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready to, at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God has called us to preach the gospel to them. God had called us to preach about his good news to the people of Macedonia, to the death and the burial and the resurrection of his son, Jesus. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, a, a famous verse, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, is the power of God that brings salvation to all those who believe. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of of the gospel of Christ, in a manner worthy of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. This is the message that's been entrusted to those approved by God, the, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. Of course, we're going to get into what that resulted, and those are all wonderful for us, but that's not possible without what Jesus did. The gospel is the good news, God's good news, of what Jesus has done. Get it? Good. Which leads me to my next question. Paul mentioned they were approved to be entrusted with this good news. Who's they? Who are the ones entrusted by God to share this message? See, here in 1 Thessalonians, uh, Paul is talking about him and his companions. Paul and Silas and Timothy, they're the ones who traveled to Thessalonica to preach the gospel there. And so Paul has written a letter back to them to remind them about their visit and, and, and what they preached. They didn't just make up some fairy tale story, but that Jesus is God and that he did give his own life on the cross and he did overcome death. So is the gospel only entrusted to Paul and Silas and Timothy? Is this message only uh, to be shared by Peter and James and John? Who has God put his trust in to share the message? Are you ready? I think you know where this is going. God's good news has been entrusted to every single person who has accepted it as truth. To borrow from last week's message, it's been entrusted to the ones who love the master. When you and I received the good news of Jesus and accepted it as it is, 
the truth, and when we responded by turning from our wicked ways uh, to him and were baptized into Christ, God washed away all of our sins. He empowered us with his Holy Spirit, and he gave us new life. Hallelujah, right? Now, part of that new life is the expectation of him, of us, that we would continue the good work of proclaiming his good news to others. God entrusted you and I with this message. It's a responsibility of every follower of Jesus to take care of and to cherish the good news of Jesus, not to hide it in the ground. God's put a trust in you and I to share this message with others. Right before he left earth and went back to heaven, Jesus, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he's with his disciples, and he says this. He says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. Well, when you become a Christian, you, you receive God's Spirit to empower you, to give you the power you need to be his witnesses. Now, what's a witness of Jesus do? simply tells the truth of what they know about Jesus, God's good news. That's what a witness does. And Jesus says, hey, start at home. Start in your Jerusalem. Start in your hometown. Then you can move to the surrounding areas. And hey, you know, just wherever you go, reach out, even if it's to the very ends of the earth, telling of what you know. Jesus died, he was buried, and he overcame death, came back to life. Paul tells us of how God's entrusted us with this message in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He calls us ambassadors. Do you know what an ambassador is? What an ambassador does? An ambassador is someone who's sent on behalf of someone else, someone who's going to go and, and speak uh, to someone on behalf of uh, their leader. That's what the Bible calls you and me. Verse 20, it says, We, followers of Jesus, are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Get this. As though God were making his appeal through us. And so we implore people on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You and I have been entrusted with the gospel. We are the ambassadors of Jesus, stewards, caretakers of his good news. And as such, we have a responsibility to do two things, know it and share it. Know it and share it. Know it. Listen, it's your responsibility God has entrusted, Almighty God entrusted this to you. So you have to read it. You have to understand it. You have to wrestle with it and believe it. You dig in and get the message right. It's the most important thing you could ever tell any human being ever. So know it and get it right. And then share it. Start in your living room with your family. And you may say, well, they already know that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's, it's never enough, right? We, it, we always need reminding of it. That's why it's all throughout the New Testament. You can't be reminded about the gospel enough. It's great encouragement, not to mention it's great practice talking to people who already know about it. But how about your extended family, those people you had dinner with this past week? How about your coworkers and your neighbors? Let me share with you the excuses I've used in the past. Maybe you relate to these. They don't want to hear it. You ever say that? You ever think that? You wouldn't say that out loud. Oh, they already believe in something else. Or how about this one? It's just too awkward. What if they ask me questions? I don't know how they're going to respond. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I know you. You're just like me. I know you've said these same things. I was so convicted this last week. Remember what Paul said in our text? We're not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. Maybe that's the paradigm shift you and I really need today. The greatest reason we, we don't share the gospel with others is because we either don't know it or we're so concerned with how they'll respond. Listen, you've not been entrusted with their response. You've been entrusted with the good news. And that good news brings eternal life. It's the responsibility of every Christ follower to know it and share it, church. 
Are you familiar with Pheidippides? How about that for a transition? I'm really good at those. Turn to somebody and say Pheidippides. It's just a really fun name to say, Pheidippides. Maybe you'll hum that on the way out today. I don't know. If you're a runner, you may be familiar with Pheidippides. I want to share the story of Pheidippides that he's most famous for. He was, one of, he was a part of the Greek military back in ancient times, a, a role that they had called a, a day-long runner. They were messengers of the military. They didn't have, like, phones and stuff. All the way back in 490 B.C., the Persians came to attack Athens on the, on the beaches of Marathon, a little town on the coast of Greece. And when they landed, of course, Athens was greatly outnumbered. The Persian army was humongous, and so they sent Pheidippides all the way to the mighty Sparta to ask for help. And so he ran 150 miles in two days. Yeah. What in the world? He gets to Sparta, says, hey, we're getting attacked by the Persians. Can you come help? And they're like, well, we're kind of in the middle of this religious festival, so when we're done, we'll be there. Awesome. So he turns and runs the 150 miles back to Athens with the dire news, hey, we're on our own, 300 miles in four days. And so Athens goes to war. And before they left to the beaches of Marathon, they told all the nobles and all their family that they were leaving behind, listen, if you don't hear about our victory by the sundown tomorrow, burn everything, salt the earth so nothing can grow, and run, because we've been destroyed. Now, Athens is known, if you know anything about history, they're known for, their, for being great thinkers, military strategists, and even though they were outnumbered, they defeat the Persians on Marathon. And so before the sun sets, Pheidippides is commissioned yet again with another message, this time of, of their victory. And so he runs the 25 miles back uh, to, to Athens, and with his dying breath, he proclaims, joy to you, we've won. And he dies. It's a great story. I mean, I love that story. I love Pheidippides. I want to be like Pheidippides. Not the running part, but I want to be like him. He gave every single ounce of effort and life to deliver the message of victory. What a great synopsis of the gospel was his message. Joy to you. We've won. Jesus wins. Joy to you. Because Jesus wins, you can have joy. We've won. That's, that's our message. That's the gospel. The good news that has been entrusted to you and has been entrusted to me. I can't help wonder how Greeks' history would have been different, and by extension, because of their great influence on us, how our own history would be different had Pheidippides not delivered the message, had he not run the course that was set out for him, had he not said yes to his commanding officer, and he just said, you know what, I'm really tired, send somebody else. Let somebody else do it. Nearing the end of his own life, the Apostle Paul made this great declaration in Acts chapter 20, in verse 24, he said, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Church, I pray that the Lord would shift our own perspectives today, and that would be the very cry of our own hearts. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the good news. Forgive us when we get it wrong. Thank you for leaving heaven to come here, for giving your own life humbly on the cross in obedience to your Father, for overcoming the grave. That's good news. Would you shift our thinking, God, to help us understand this isn't just something that some people do, but that you have entrusted. You have given each one of us the responsibility of sharing this news. God, would you find us faithful to know it and share it. In the name of Jesus, amen.